Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for being here today for uh, teaching this lesson. <clears throat> it's hard to grasp. We don't all understand it all, but we'd ask that you send the Holy Spirit with us today that we um, can learn more about the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyway, I, I, I start out to tell you that I don't understand a lot of things. There's a, a lot of things I don't understand because this whole world is, is just phenomenal. God created it just absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> and who am I to be questioning anything because I don't have enough knowledge? I want to share you with you some of the amazing things I saw this week, two things. <clears throat> That I don't even understand, but uh, some years ago I fed the birds outside in front of my house and, and all these sunflowers grew up, so I let them grow up every year. And they're right in front of my kitchen window and, I, and, I, and this time of year <clears throat> there's these little birds that come and eat the seeds off the sunflowers and that's why I let them grow because they're so beautiful. They, they start out to be black and I think they're house finches. They, they turn multiple colors. They're black first, then they're white. Then they get the specks of yellow in them. And then pretty soon they all turn yellow. Sometimes they turn green. And I saw a, a yellow bird feeding, picking a, a seed off of the sunflower and feeding it to another bird that was black that was almost her size. But it, it, it was just so adorable. And you think God has... <clears throat> at that particular time changes those birds colors so the, so they blend in with the sunflowers the green sunflowers and the yellow sunflowers and the black sunflowers and i don't understand it i saw another amazing thing last night i i went outside my house faces south but i i went to the east and i was staring up at the sky because I, I, I think the sky is phenomenal. I don't understand a thing about it. But I saw this um, meteorite come across the sky. And it started in the south. And it went clear into the north. It didn't go that fast. It didn't go that slow. But it was just huge. It was round and it was red. And it had a long white tail on it. And I, I could have said, hey, look at that. And if you hadn't been looking up, you'd have had the time to look up and see it because it, it went that long and, and slower than most of them. I, I go out to a, the farm all, all the time and look up at the sky and, and watch for meteorites, and they go by so fast you, you don't even have time to hardly see them. But this one went a lot snow, slower. I hope somebody else in this town saw the same thing and could talk more about it, but I don't understand it. See, I, I don't understand that. I, don't un, uh, I just almost uh, don't understand anything in, in this world. So how can I really relate to Jesus Christ and, and, and what he went through for us? And maybe you can all help me out here, but I'm going to start out with the, the memory verse. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, 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 I can't pronounce it. My God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and you wonder, at, at this moment, Jesus Christ thought he was forsaken by his Father. Can you even relate to that? As, as a child... If, if some of you maybe were a small child and you, and you were being abandoned by your mother or your father, there's lots of kids that get abandoned by their mother and their father. And, and how awful it must feel. That's only a glimpse maybe of what Jesus what Christ was feeling at, at the time that he was taking on the sins of the world and he thought that he was... He was uh, Never going to see his father again. He, he feeling abandoned by his father because, because of the circumstances. Can you understand that? The question is asked on, on uh, 
Sabbath lesson is, what did Christ suffer in our behalf? What, we, what can we learn from his suffering? Well, I, I start out telling you about, about as a child, you, you think of the physical torture, and it wasn't the physical torture, I guess, that was bothering him so bad. But the lesson points out, let me read it just to start with here. Whenever we look at the issues of suffering, the question comes, how did sin and suffering ri first rise? Through divine revelation, we have good answers. They arose from being, from free beings abuse the freedom that God has given them. This leads to another question. Did God know beforehand that these things would, beginning could, would fail? Yes, but... Obviously, he thought it was worth the risk. It was worth the risk, and and there and there's a a, a Bible text that tells us that he he knew us, he loved us before the world was even created. Can you even understand that? That is that is phenomenal. To think that that he loved us before we were even created. Uh, do you actually love your children before they're they're even uh, before you even conceived them? You know, <laughs> and that, that's a, that's what humans think. Uh, and and I'm thinking. I'm trying to think of a, a story of. Of dying for my own sins, a story in the Bible, and the only one I can really think of is Jacob. Remember, he stole his brother's birthright. He stole his brother's birthright, but but I think one of the worst things he did was lie to his father about it, you know. And then he got the birthright from his father. He lied to his father, his father who loved him the most. And how many years did he spend in isolation and living with Laban and all that? How, how many years went by? And he, was, and he had ample proof before he even got there that God had forgiven him and God was going to be with him and take care of him and all that. But he was still living with this guilt. And so he wrestled with the angel. Why was he wrestling with the angel all night long? What did he want out of this angel? He didn't know it was an angel at first. He was, he was wrestling with the angel because he wanted a blessing. He wanted a blessing from God. He wanted his sins forgiven. He wanted his, to know that his sins were forgiven. He... If his sins hadn't been forgiven, he was going to die for his own sins, wasn't he? And he, and he, and he just felt horrible. Did any of you sin so bad that you feel like that, that God can't even forgive you? And you would love to have the assurance that Jesus uh, for, has forgiven you of your sins, you know? That's all Jacob wanted. He, he wasn't... Uh, at that moment, he wasn't worried about anything else, but he just wanted the assurance that God had forgiven him of his sins after all that time. Is there, is there a time in, in Ellen White's writing that she talks about in the last days, what, and if we're still alive, what we're going to go through? Right, well, we, do go through, we will go through the time of Jacob's trouble. What was Jacob's trouble? We are going to wonder whether our sins are covered or not. We will be pleading with God to forgive us. We will be trying to figure out all of all of uh, the sins that we want forgiven, and maybe we maybe we've forgotten these sins. Um, that's a, that's an awesome thing, isn't it? To think that now. We, we want to start out with Sunday's lesson where it talks about what Jesus Christ went through on this earth. And we like to think of ourselves 
as what we've gone through. And a lot of people go through some awful things. Uh, and but, but can you really say, especially here in the United States, I, I grew up on a farm and we had everything we needed, but it was rather primitive. And I've told you my story most of the time. But here we are talking about Jesus, in, and he was born into absolute poverty. You know, it was so bad that Mary didn't even have a blanket to wrap him in. She used strips to wrap him in and, and laid him in a manger. There was, there was, the whole world was unaware that he had come except a few maybe, and then, and then he was laid in a manger. He, di he didn't, <clears throat> that's pretty poverty. <clears throat> what was the next thing that was top on the list? Herod was going out to kill him. Uh, Herod <clears throat> heard that the Jewish Messiah was born and he wanted, he wanted him dead. So, so right away, the angel had to come to Joseph and Mary and tell him to go somewhere else for a while till Herod died. So, and I, I can't imagine how impoverished it was. There they had nothing. They had to get back on the donkey and, and travel far away to get away from Herod. Uh, says, of course, Jesus was not the first person to live in poverty or face those who wanted to kill him, even from an early age. There is, however, another element that helps us understand the uniqueness of what Christ suffered in those early days. And let's turn to uh, John 1, 46. I'll start with uh, 45 first. It says, Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth? <laughs> what good thing can come out of Nazareth? Have any of you born in a, in a place where <laughs> it wasn't the most popular in the world and, and you felt uh, sort of a, a put down a good share of your life because you'd you were born on the other side of the track or something, you know? Maybe none of you were, and maybe I wasn't either. However, I was born on, on what was the part of the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. We went to a country school, but the Indians all went to boarding school, so we didn't go to school with any of them, but when you think of Dewey County in South Dakota on the Standing Rock Reservation, it wasn't too glorious, I'll tell you. And because of some of those things, did you ever feel like you didn't fit in? Sometimes you didn't feel like you even fit in your own church because of you lived on the other side of the river. Uh, it, it was a coal sack cut off from practically the whole world. There's no underground water there. There's no electricity because the power company wouldn't bring us down to it because there wasn't that many people living there. So over on the east side, that had been established a lot sooner than our part was. And most of those people took over their grandfather's farm and the place was already built up and they had electricity, they had telephone, they had, they had running water. It wasn't easy to keep six kids clean, <laughs> get them to church, drive 25 miles to church in, on Sabbath morning and get there on time. Sometimes you felt like maybe you weren't quite clean enough, maybe your clothes weren't quite good enough. Then you got shipped off to Union or Plainview Academy where, where it was the same thing again. Do you really fit in? However, I said this to my friend. You know what? When I started Academy, I was 
I was the most naive student there. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, you weren't. She says, I was. So just because I felt like that way, maybe all the rest of them felt that way too, you know. Uh, sometimes as a, as a child, you just don't quite fit in. But But here we have Jesus. Did he fit in? I mean, here, right away, they said, uh, Nazareth, what good can come out of Nazareth? What else stigma did Jesus have against him? Everybody in Nazareth knew that Mary was pregnant before she got married. And who was Jesus' father? You know, there was that stigma over his head all, all the time. Uh, so... So he had a lot thrown against her. Uh, the question is asked, how sensitive am I to the sin that exists all around this world? So it talks about how, how Jesus, uh, Jesus was emerged in any world of sin. What torture is, it must have been, even as a child, for his pure soul constantly to be, to, to be in contact with sin. Do you ever feel like you don't fit into this world because of what you stand up for? I, I can only relate to myself. If you want to tell your stories, it, it's fine with me. <laughs> I'll let you, but, but I'm talking about my church, and I love my church very dearly. I, uh, even back then I did, but we were the only vegetarians in that whole church. And when we went to Plainview Academy, most of those kids were not vegetarians. And, of course, the Academy only served vegetarian meals. And we, I heard all these griping and complaining about the food there and everything, uh, which I never ate anyway, so uh, the food was fine with me. But but when you, when you think of not fitting in and in a world of sin but but that's not the only thing how about today do you fit in this world do you feel like you just don't fit in this world sometimes I, I just find myself crying out to God and saying God I don't belong in this world I, I, I just I just can't fit in uh, and you can't fit in you know, we live in Rapid City, and, and, we, and we, we're merged with a whole bunch of people, so, so we can fit in a little pretty well. But what would you think if you, if you were to now move out of Rapid City and move to a little town where everybody in that town knows each other? I, I related to this story in Mobridge. I, was, I, I don't know if some of you know that I have a niece that married pastor she'd been single for 20 years and she married this pastor in California and they moved to Pier and they're pastoring the Pier and the Bottle Church so so I think that the, I'm, I'm glad for it they, they got out of California and they seem to be very very happy there uh, but we're He's an, uh, a guy from Australia. He was an Englishman, born in English and raised in Australia. And he talks with a little brogue, and we wondered how he's going to fit in. Uh, but uh, it seem, seems like they're very happy there and are, are fitting in. But <clears throat> do you feel like that you fit in this world? M moving to Qu Quinn or moving to Mobridge, oh, I'll, what I was going to tell you about this pastor is, the conference told him, you have Bottle and you have Pier, and you can have Mobridge. The church is closed there. Everybody's died except one man, and he's about to die. But he said, you can do with you what you want with Mobridge. Now in Mobridge, at least, there's four Lutheran churches there. There's Catholic churches there. There's a, a generic church. There's a some other... There's a lot of churches in that church. Tell me what chances that man would would have to to come into Mobridge and reopen that church and start evangelizing. I mean, I don't want to second guess God or anything, but you you think 
Those people who know immediately, here comes the Adventists, you know. That's my thinking. <laughs> but I, I guess the conference has sold the church now, or he thinks he's got it sold, but anyway, they probably won't start one in there. But how could you move as a Seventh-day Adventist into a small town and try to fit in? You think that you would fit in? When Friday night comes, you say, I can't do this, I can't do that. You're invited out to eat. Well, I don't eat this, I don't eat that. Uh, I don't work on Sabbath. No, I, don't, I can't go to your ball games. I can't, I can't join in with you people. Do you feel like you could fit in there? Well, here's this Jesus. He's from Nazareth. Did he fit in? <laughs> I mean, they were picking on him probably from day one be, being born. Let's go to Monday's lesson. And then when Jesus comes into his ministry, did he, did he fit in? Did, have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever been trying to explain to somebody? Or, and, and this person is very, very controversial. Uh, and, and twist everything you said. Uh, let me read. It says, the following text, all the while keeping in mind the fact that Jesus was divine, the creator of the heaven and earth, and that he came to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Uh, how do these texts help us to understand suffering that Jesus faced on this earth? The, the, the first one is Matthew 12, 22, and uh, turn to Matthew 12, 22, I'll read it. Caption of this text is Jesus, the Prince of Demons. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. He heralded the man he healed the man so that he could both speak and see. The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be that Jesus is the son of David the Messiah? Here again, we have the innocent crowd, the people who don't, are just plain innocent, uh, don't understand. Uh, like I'm telling you, I don't understand the world. I don't understand most of the stuff that's, that's going on. But here, the innocent ones, they saw. They saw this man being healed. They, they saw that he could now speak and that he could now see. But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Here, here he, he did one of the most phenomenal miracles. And he was put down for it because he was getting his, his power from the devil, the prince of demons. And yes, I, I understand what you're saying. Jesus even cautioned us by saying, when you're being rejected, I don't take it so personally because they're rejecting me, not you. Uh, so that's good to remember. Don't take it so personal when you're being rejected because because they're really not rejecting you; they're rejecting me. Um, and thank you for that uh, that thought, but. Yeah, I understand that. I, he said it's not unusual for human nature to want to be accepted by the people around us. And I, th I think very much about, well, first time really I, I got out away from the farm and that little tiny community was going to Plainview Academy. And yes, when you're when you're a, a freshman in an academy, you want very much to be accepted, and you and you'll do almost anything to.
fit in and be accepted, but but uh, it shouldn't be about self and about us. And but tell that to a little kid that's <laughs> that got separated from his mother and father at such a tender age. Um, Uh, and you, and you're saying, yes, he 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 could feel because he was human. He had the human feelings that we have. He could feel that he was being rejected and all that. But he had a strong connection with God. How do you have a strong connection? How did Jesus have this strong connection with God? I hear you all that. His connection was with prayer. He went away long periods of time just to pray, especially at night, going up into the mountains and, and, and praying and wrestling with God, all wrestling with, I don't know if you want to say his soul or, or his human feelings and, and getting that connection with God, getting that assurance from God. And that's probably our biggest downfall, my biggest downfall, it's, it's hard to find a time <laughs> to get in that prayer, to have a <clears throat> isolation from this world so you can talk to God, you know. On Monday's lesson, this talk said he was despised and rejected by God, or by man. Uh, and, and turn to John 8. I'd like to read that, John 8. I'll start with 54. Jesus said, if I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. And, and there throws in a, a text that if he wanted glory for himself, he, it doesn't count. But it is my Father who will glorify me. You say he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him. If I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you are, but I do know him and obey him. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He said it, he saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say that, that you've seen Abraham? Well, here they go. Right away they jump in, they don't even try to understand what he's saying or understand him or consider who he might even be after seeing the miracles that he's been doing. And then Jesus answers and says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up st stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. Uh... That was at the beginning of his ministry, so uh, so God prepared a way for him, or they would have killed him, they would have stoned him, but God stepped in and prepared a way for them so that he could continue with his ministry. And Jesus pleads for us people that he loves, and I, and I think this is one of, one of the best lessons and scenarios we can find in the Bible. It's found in Matthew 23. We can relate to this. And, and Jesus is pouring out, I see him pouring out his heart. And you might even say the suffering he was going through for us because of realizing how he was trying to reach us and being rejected. Matthew 23, 37. I'm going to start with 34. Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law, but you will kill some of my, uh, you will, but you will kill some by crucifixion. You will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from the 
from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all uh, godly people of all times, from the murders of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, the son of Brecon, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altars. I tell you the truth. This judgment will fall on on every generation. And, and he's... And he's talking about, I've sent you prophet after prophet after prophet, and you've stoned them, you, you've killed them, you've, you've uh, chased them out of the cities, you've crucified them. And then, he, then, then his words was with grief over Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is abandoned and desolate, for I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he is pleading, pouring his heart out and said, I would have done anything. The parable he can use is of a mother hen protecting your children. It, any of you ever raised chickens? Uh, we raised them out in the farm, and we just had to let them run, you know. But there's chicken hawks that are always out there to get them. And you, you could see this mother hen many a time fluffing out her wings and squatting down and, and, and talking to her little babies and they come flocking in and get under her wings for protection and Jesus is saying I would have done that for you but you rejected me you know uh, Tuesday's lessons turn to Tuesday's lessons <clears throat> Ephesians 1 4 I I I've talked about that one before already in this lesson. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eye. God declares in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gives him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glor glorious grace he has poured out upon us. Even before the world was created, he loved us. That's phenomenal, isn't it? There was a plan made for us if we exercised our freedom of choice and went the wrong direction. Uh, this is the agony that Jesus went through. Turn to Luke 22. This is a very, very hard lesson and is a very sad lesson. And I think if my father was up here teaching it, he would just be crying all over the place because he, he cried easily when it come to singing songs at church, preaching a sermon, teaching a lesson, whatever he was doing, he, he cried real easy. I'm not a crier. My mother was not a crier either. I guess I take after my mother, but this is a very, very, very sad, sad story that we're talking about today. Uh, and it isn't that I can't relate to it. It's just that I can hold in my emotions. But we should all be crying, shouldn't we? Luke twenty two forty one. Jesus was praying on the Mount of Olives. He took his disciples up there. This was the last the last day of his normal life. Then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives where he told them, 
pray that you will not give in to temptation. He asked them to stay awake and pray. And what did they do? He walked about a stone's throw and threw down and knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup, cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Uh, it says, then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Have we ever heard of anybody being in such agony that they sweat blood instead of, of sweat? Have you ever? Well, that's interesting, but... I, we never, as the general public, get to, get to hear that. But, but he was in such agony that he, he sweat great drops of blood. The angels had to come and support him, and give him strength again, or maybe he would have died there. I. At last, he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Here he was the Thursday, before, or Thursday night before his crucifixion or Friday morning, and he couldn't even, he was deserted by his disciples. He couldn't even count on them to pray. Uh... The lesson talks about the only way Christ was now standing in a different attitude from, from that in which he had ever stood before. His suffering can best be described in the words of the prophet. And this one I have a hard time understanding too. It's in Zechariah 13, 7. But it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And, and this must be God saying this against Jesus, uh, uh, against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of, of hosts. I tried to look up different versions and try to try to understand this text better, but they all said the same thing, so... So does someone else have a, a suggestion they want to make about this? Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And this is, this must be God pouring out the wrath on, on Jesus for, for sin. And this is how bad sin is. Sin is terrible, abhorrent. To, to God, and he had to die. Somebody had to die for these sins, and we, on the bottom of this lesson, it says, dwell upon what happened to Jesus in Gethsemane. Already the sins of the world were starting to fall upon him. Try to imagine what that must have been like. No human being has ever been called to go through anything like this before or since. What does this tell us about God's love for us? What hope can you draw from this from yourself? Now it talks about, try to imagine what it must have been like. No human being has ever been called to go through anything like this before. And that is, is, is hard to understand because of how bad it really was because lots of people suffer in this world. Uh, I alluded to the Holocaust and the and those people, that, what they went through. Think of what's going through, what those people are going through over in Ukraine. I mean, they're being slaughtered like pigs. And, and, and do, you th do you think that they don't cry out and say, where's God? You know, I, I can't take this anymore. 
This is too much suffering for me. And then do you think that Jesus went through something worse than that? Can, can you understand it? Can you grasp it, your hands around that? It's hard to believe that God would do that for us and, and that we could treat God the way we did, <laughs> you know? But on Wednesday's lesson, it talks about the crucifixion and that more was going on than, than really meets the eye for a lot of people. But, but what was the significance that at about noon, darkness fell all over the, all over the land? And that the curtain in the temple was ripped from the bottom to the top, which was an impossibility for man to do. Uh, and, and, a, and a horrible, horrible earthquake hit. Rocks uh, were split in half. Graves were open. People came forth from the graves and went into the cities and testified. Wouldn't you like to have a whole Bible uh, chapter written on, on those people that went into the cities to testify of Jesus Christ? Uh, but we don't have much about that. It says clearly something much more was happening here that, than just the death. However unfair of, of an innocent man, according to scriptures, God's wrath against sin, our sin, was poured out upon Jesus. Jesus on the cross suffered a, a righteous God's righteousness and indignation against sin. Let me read that again. Jesus on the cross suffered a righteous God's righteousness in indignation against sin. It was all about sin and God's wrath ag against how bad sin is. Indignation against sin, the sin of the whole world. As such, Jesus suffered something deeper, darker, and more painful than any human being could ever experience. And I, the lesson suggests he, he was suffering for the whole sins of the world. He had the whole sins of the world on his shoulders, not just like me having the sins of my sins on my shoulders if, if Jesus Christ doesn't, doesn't cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But he had the sins of the whole world. That's hard to fathom, isn't it? And, and then coupled with the fact that he, he cries out, my God, you have forsaken me. He, he felt the separation from his God at that moment. And that, that must have been the most painful of it all, that he, he was being shut out from God. Uh, says, through faith, we can stand perfect in Jesus right now. We have the promise of eternal life. Uh, we have the promise that because of what Christ has done, because of the fullness and completeness of his perfect life and perfect sacrifice, our experience here, full of pain, disappointment, and loss, is no more than an instant, a flash here that is gone. And, and as you get older and I am older, you really realize that life is really just a flash in contrast to the eternity that awaits us. And eternity is a new heaven, a new earth, one without sin, suffering and death. All this is promised to us and made certain for us only because of Christ and his crucible he went into so that one day coming soon, we will see the traverse of his soul and he will see the Travis of his soul and shall be satisfied. He will be satisfied with us who he came to die for. So don't disappoint God, okay? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that Jesus Christ came to this earth to sacrifice himself for our sins. 
We just ask you, Lord, as we commit ourselves again, a newness to Jesus Christ and accepting him as our Savior, you will forgive us of our sins and we can be amongst those that are taken to heaven when you come. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody.